Let's open our Bibles. You can open to, uh, let's see, the first spot we're going to be is Galatians 2.20. As you're turning there, what we're looking at this morning before communion is that the justifying uh, death, if I can get it to go, there we go, the justifying death of Christ, uh, and, and I want you to, to center on two words here, the justifying death of Christ opens for me the sanctifying life of Christ. Now, justification and sanctification are two sides of the same coin. If salvation were reduced to a coin, they would have two sides, that coin would. The justifying death of Christ is the one side. The other side is the sanctifying life of Christ, his righteousness applied to me. And that two-part kind of like a two-stroke engine drives the gospel. That everybody that God justifies, he also sanctifies. And everybody that wants to be sanctified can only have the power to see the sanctifying work of Christ through the justifying death of Christ. And so that's the whole emphasis of, of where we're going this morning. Basically, what I'm saying is that the Bible says that the gospel gives us the divine power to live out the new life that we received in Jesus Christ. And what Christianity needs is to be a group of individuals living a life that's humanly impossible to live. Not trying real hard to keep a bunch of rules and conform to some group standard, but the unleashing of God living within. I, I was walking through the lobby before the service always do. It's my hobby. I love it. And I was going to talk to people, and I talked to one of our octogenarians. You know what that means, right? And so as I was talking to this octogenarian who just radiates hope, you find this person serving all over the place uh, in, in the church. They were sitting there. They'd brought someone this morning and were introducing me to him. And I said to them, you reflect Christ. And they looked at me and said, not very well. That's humility. Uh, I said, no, you do. And they said, why do you say that? I said, because it's very hard to hide having God living inside. Do you understand that? Salvation, our new life in Christ is God moved in. That's what Emmanuel, God what? With us. You see, God is supposed to be with us going through life. When Daniel walked through the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar said, the spirit of the holy gods lives in him. Wow. When Joseph walked through ancient pagan witchcraft-laced Egypt, when he got in front of Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, the spirit of the gods is in you. See, they didn't know the vocabulary. They didn't know it was the Holy Spirit of God, the third person, the Trinity. They just saw God in them. The justifying work of Christ on the cross opens for us the sanctifying life of Christ lived out through us. That means God is seen living out through us. So when you give people an invitation to the season of hope. They will want it because they see the spirit of the gods if they don't know who the Lord is. But they see something, a quality, a power, a presence in our lives that they don't have. They are wired for hopelessness and new life in Christ changes all that. Well, basically, Christians go through life living in two worlds. Uh, it, remember, uh, the Apostle Paul put it this way, our citizenship is in heaven, but we still live on earth. I'd rather go there, but it's more needful for me to stay here. So we kind of have this, this dual way of life. Our citizenship, where we're headed, where, where our, our home is being built, where we can't wait to get to, is in heaven, but we're still on earth. And that two-part life 
is based on the past work of Christ for me. What Jesus did in the past, which we're going to look at in Galatians 2.20 in just a moment, is the justifying death of Christ on the cross. When Jesus Christ became sin, was treated like sin, was, was horrifically maligned and, and, and spat upon and, and had what we couldn't see, all the horrors of the spirit world arrayed against him, and most horrific, God treating Jesus like he'd committed our sins. Jesus never sinned, but God treated him like he did. That's what the past work of Christ once for all on the cross was. But that opens for me the present work of Christ. You see, when you find people that claim to have the justifying work of Christ, but there's no present work of Christ in their life, it's kind of like going to, in fact, I was standing in line. Oh, where was it? Uh, something I was buying. Oh, I was at McDonald's in Pawpaw for one of the Bible studies, and this lady came up and handed the McDonald's person a $100 bill for a cup of coffee. Whoa. Boy, that's... I almost got up and said, do you have room for one more <laughs> cup? Uh, you know, you got a lot of money there. And the clerk didn't know what to do, and they pushed a button, and the manager came out, and you can always tell the manager, he has like six cell phones on him and keys this big, you know, and a big headset on, and he ran out and took that $100 bill and goes, then he gets his marker. Boy, that would have made me feel bad. But he didn't want what? He didn't want to sell her a cup of coffee. No, he didn't want to receive what? Counterfeit. If you got 100 or 20 or whatever, and you picked up that piece of currency and you saw old, you know, Andrew Jackson, I think he's the 20 guy, and you turned to the other side and it was perfectly blank. What you should do is hand it back to whoever gave it to you because there's something missing. It's not real. It's not, it's not legal as it says on it, legal tender. But yet when you see someone that claims that the past work of Christ they've trusted, but you see after knowing them for a while, no present work of Christ in their life. There is no sign of sanctification. Then the Bible says we're to say to them, you need to examine yourself, whether you're in the faith. I don't determine who's going to heaven, but you look counterfeit by every standard in the Bible. Do you understand the justifying death of Christ opens for me, for every moment of my existence, the sanctifying life of Christ. And what does that mean? Well, let's look at Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Two parts to this one life are contained in this verse, and all the way through the scriptures, by the way. What I'm talking about is central to every New Testament epistle, and you can look back and see it all the way through the Old Testament. Because if anybody in the Old Testament is going to be in heaven, it's because of the justifying death of Christ. And if anybody in the Old Testament lived any type of righteous life, it was not their own. It was the righteousness that God gave to them by faith. Remember Abraham? That it was accounted, it was imputed, it was given to him by faith. And he became God's friend. How do you get that? It was the, the perfect life of Christ that was the righteousness of God in God the Son credited to him. So what are the two parts of our life? Number one, the justifying death of Christ. Look at Galatians 2.20. Here's the justifying death of Christ. I have been, this is the once for all event on the cross, crucified with Christ. And then I have faith in the Son of God and what is it talked about? The one who loved me and gave himself for me. So the justifying death of Christ is the crucifixion when the Son of God gave himself for me. That's the first part of the two sides of legal tender, of non-counterfeit spiritual life. A, a complete trust in the justifying death of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't end there. Uh, every, every time, you know, I can still see that 
McDonald's manager looking through that hundred. I think he was looking for the little strip or whatever, that ribbon that's supposed to be in there. If any of you have a hundred dollar bill, I'd like to look at it and look for that strip, you know. Uh, I'm teasing. But I think there's some kind of a something that says a hundred dollars that he was looking for. So what he was trying to examine is whether or not it was genuine. Well, if someone says, I have been justified freely by his grace, I'm saved. When you hold their life up to the light, this is what you'll see. See, the evidence of a claim of salvation is that it's no longer I who live. A, born, a truly born-again person, it's not them anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. That's why I told my dear octogenarian friend, I see God reflected through your life because it's not you anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's the sanctifying work of Christ. That's what he wants to do in and through us. And so Christ justifying one-time death. Remember Hebrews 10 says he died once. That's what's wrong with the largest segment of so-called Christianity. Romanism, the Roman Catholic Church, does not believe this. The mass is built, is predicated on the continuous need to offer Christ. Jesus died once for all, never to be repeated, not even in a church ceremony, in an altar at, at mass. He justified us through his one-time death on the cross, but that starts... See, salvation is just the beginning of a lifelong, sanctifying, life-changing walk of faith. This is the way Paul put it. As you receive the Lord, so walk in him. We received him completely by faith. I mean, my mother opened the Bible, showed me John 3, 16, put my name into there, and said, if you will call the name of the Lord, he'll save you. I mean, I didn't see him. I didn't hear his voice. I didn't have an angel, no glowing anything. I just saw paper. But in my heart... I believed that Jesus took my place. And that, that walk of faith that changed me was faith in that work of Christ. But it launches a lifelong, sanctifying, life-changing walk that's also by faith. It's believing that the same God that saved me is going to change me to look more and more like Jesus, to act more and more like Jesus to respond more and more like Jesus. When I was a truck driver in Okemos, Michigan, delivering DECA batteries all over the state of Michigan when I was at the end of high school in 1975, I used to go in there with those cigar-chomping, cussing, uh, you know, truck drivers. And I would read my Bible during breaks because they were all talking about what girl they had conquered the night before and it was, you know, it was the only place we could sit. So I would try and focus on the word rather than their stories and they would make fun of me. But you know what? When they had their, their first marriage problem, they didn't talk to the guys conquering girls. They, came to, they called me the deacon, by the way, at the, at the trucking company. They, oh, the deacon is reading his Bible. We should tone down our stories. And I'd smile at him and say, it would be nice if you did. You know, but I'd just try and be polite. But when their wife got cancer, when they had a bad medical test, when they got a DUI, do you know who they talked to? They talked to the one who they knew was connected to God. Because they see that we respond like Jesus, we live life more and more in step with Christ, and that's what God wants to do in us, and he wants us to realize. Now, Basically, the whole Bible is, is geared around this two-part. This positional truth, that's the justifying uh, death of Christ on the cross, and the practical choices, that's our sanctifying life of Christ lived out. And, and it's illustrated all the way through the Bible, and that's what I want to show you this morning. And, and the place it's most illustrated, by the way, how we got here is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The scriptures tell us that it's the word of God that sanctifies us. That, that Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so the way that we get uh, the sanctified is through the word of God. And the biggest chapter in the Bible 
where we are this morning. The 119 Psalm is all about that. So let's dive into it. Psalm 119. And, and just look in your Bibles and tech. I wasn't going to have you stand for the reading of Scripture because it would take nine minutes, okay, to read this. So just sit for this. Okay, Psalm 119.1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. Now, everybody has read that, and, and we always pause and think, oh, man, I know who I am. I'm not undefiled. I am the worst sinner I know. I, I, I am painfully aware of my sin. How can the Bible say that God blesses those who are undefiled? It's because this is the truth of the justifying death of Christ. We are in Christ. We are a new creation. We have no record of sin against us by faith in the justifying death of Christ. That's what this whole first line of Psalm 119 is about. The undefiled in the way is code for someone that's been justified by the death of Christ. You said, you might ask, how would Ezra, who lived five centuries before the cross, be justified by the death of Christ? the same way we're justified 20 centuries after it. I wasn't at the cross. I never saw it happen. Neither was Ezra. He didn't see it happen. But by faith, he looked forward. And by faith, I look back. See, everybody's been saved the same way on both sides of the cross. They look forward through all of their sacrifices, which they knew could never save them, to a perfect Lamb of God. We look back at that same perfect sacrifice. So God led Ezra, as he wrote Psalm 119, to talk about this new creation we are. And, and the undefiled in the way are who we are in Christ. But look what it says. They walk right now. And you say, what's that? We're now having a daily choice to live out the sanctifying life of Christ. Did you hear Marcia? Quoting for us Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, she has chosen, because she has a new heart, to walk God's way. Not perfectly, none of us do, but like we just sang, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And so you see this beautiful two-part, the justifying death makes me undefiled and forever headed toward heaven. I'm already addressed. And God, it's kind of like um, registered mail and, or whatever the one is that you can send diamonds through the mail. Uh, up to a million dollars, the post office will insure it and someone will ride over it with a machine gun and get it safely there if you pay for it, you know, and get your package once it's certified or registered, whichever one is the big top one that you pay for. Higher than that is God says, I've written my name on you. I've deposited my spirit within you, and I'm going to get you safely home. And so if you have the justifying death of Christ, the daily portion is, I now want to walk. Do I perfectly walk? No. Do I endlessly walk that way? No. But I want to because I have a new heart. That's what the gospel says. Look at verse 2. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. We have a new soft heart. That's the product of justification. A new heart I will give you, Ezekiel 36 says. We want to obey God. It was given to us by faith. I already have that, that heart that keeps. This word means to guard or to, uh, like, like to, to uh, have it in a vault that's protected. I want with my new heart God's testimonies. But the practical response is, I seek him. We now get to make a choice each day to live out the sanctifying life of Christ. Jesus put it this way, he that has my commandments and keeps them is the one that what? Loves me. My justified heart makes me love obeying God and feeling horrible when I don't. The third verse, they also do no iniquity. You go, whoa, what's that talking about? That's talking about what 1 John says. 1 John says, we who were born of God no longer live in an unbroken life direction of sin because we were liberated by faith in the justifying death of Christ. I don't do iniquity. You know, some people do. It's their lifestyle. Now, I sin and fall painfully short of the glory of God, but I don't like it. It's kind of like the difference between pigs and sheep. Pigs love mud. Sheep don't. Sheep get dirty but you can tell they don't like it. It's kind of like, you ever seen cats, you know, and they, they don't like it, they shake it. But pigs run for it. And God says, when you got saved and when I got saved, 
He didn't wash up pigs. He regenerated us from being pigs that love sin into new creations that don't do. We might stumble and fall. We might yield and give in, but it's against everything within us. We don't love the old ways, the old darkness anymore. We love the one who transformed us from darkness to light. And so now, the, so that's the justifying uh, death of Christ. Now they walk in his ways. Now we have been set free. We, by grace, make choices to live out the sanctifying life of Christ. That's our desire. That's our heart. That's our, our constant direction. The fourth and fifth verses, you have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. We at salvation, you know how the Bible describes us, salvation is when God's law is written on our hearts. He writes new code. We have a new operating system. We, we want to keep his precepts because they're on our hearts and when we place faith in Christ. But then look at the, the response that sanctification brings in us. Oh, that my ways. I want more and more of my life surrendered. My ways. The way I think, the way I act, the way I talk, the way I relate to people, my interpersonal relationships, my, my long-term goals, my true appetites. I want all of my ways for you to direct them to keep your statutes. The cry of the new heart given by Christ is that we now want to make those choices to live in the sanctifying life of Christ. I really want to surrender more and more of my life to Christ. You know, you know I've had one of the nicest year-long journeys uh, in these 10 Bible studies that started actually, some of them, last Thanksgiving. And, and I've gone through life with these 30-some men that are in all these studies. Uh, all but about six of them come here and uh, are out there. They always, they always kind of settle down their seats hoping what stories I'm going to tell about them because I meet with them every week. But uh, one of the things I've noticed is almost every week, different ones of them, this past week, different ones of them said, I can't believe how much my life is changing. What they're saying is they were saved but the more they're exposed to the sanctifying word of God, they want. They say it's not any longer, I have to do that, I'm supposed to do that. I want to do that. I want to be the greatest servant in my household. One of the men said that he came home and his wife was, had fallen asleep in the chair. And she's not any kind of lazy slug or anything, it's just they have several children and she was worn out and he got home and he told us this the Bible study he said to her what's up honey she said I'm so tired he said why are you so tired she said I can't keep up with everything he says wow I keep up with everything outside I mow the lawn and everything how come you can't get it all done inside <laughs> whoa he reported that to us I said wow I said, so what did you do? Did you do the dishes? He said, no, that's the inside work. I said, did you fold any clothes? No, that's inside work. I said, whoa, you need some coaching here. I said, <laughs> I said, did you know Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. And whoever's greatest is the one that serves the most. I said, you're supposed to be the absolute paragon of servanthood in the house. And he said, I am outside. I said, no, inside. <laughs> and, and, he says, yeah, my wife says I spend too much time outside clipping. And I mean, he has like a golf course outside, and the inside's a wreck. And, and so he said, no. I said, yeah. He said, what do I do? I said, well, pray that she falls asleep again. And while she's sleeping, fold everything, load, unload, put everything, scrub, clean, wipe around. And she'll think that you have cancer or something, you know, or you're leaving her because you're so radically different. And it worked. She fell asleep again uh, when he came home late that night, and he dutifully folded. I don't think I don't know if he did very well. He hasn't done it much, but he tried. And he did the kitchen and everything. And she woke up. She heard a sound. She says, "What are you doing?" And he said, "Oh, it's okay. I'm just trying to help." She says, "Why?" <laughs> because I want I want to live out what the Bible says that a husband is supposed to reflect Christ who came in when no one else would do it and he became the greatest servant to all of them. So you know what I mean. I don't need to go on that. Verse 6 says, I won't be ashamed. 
What is that talking about? That's talking about our position, our justification. We're never ashamed. We can come boldly before the throne of grace and mercy. Why? Because we have our faith anchored that Jesus died once for all for our sins, and I'm never going to be condemned for my sins. In fact, God doesn't even have a record of them. All my friends do, and my family, but God doesn't have a record of my sins. They're already posted on Christ's account. And what does that do to me? Then I want to look into all your commandments. As I read God's word, I do so wanting to respond. When I read the Bible, I want to make choices that mirror the sanctifying life of Christ. Why? Because I love him. See, Bible study becomes like like being engaged to someone you can't wait to marry and you're getting notes for them and you just savor them and think about them more and more and can't wait to spend more time with them. That's what Bible study is because we're betrothed and engaged and we are Christ beloved that we are headed to a marriage ceremony with him forever. And his love letter are his commandments, his truth, his word. And so, I will praise you with uprightness of heart. So I can come before God at this communion and any other time and know I have an upright heart because I have a new heart that was given to me when I was regenerated by Christ. It was placed within me when I placed my faith in the justifying death of Christ. So I have an upright heart. I have a righteous heart. I have a new heart. I have a clean heart. Now, Jesus said, you know, you, you still need to wash your feet, but the rest of you is completely washed. We go through life, and there's things we have to keep confessing and forsaking and seeking cleansing, but we have been justified. We're upright in God's sight. And then the, the practical side of that is I get to learn his righteous judgments. Those are the series of new choices I want to make to live the sanctifying life of Christ. It's a lifelong learning. The eighth verse, I will keep your statures. Oh, do not forsake me utterly, because... Because of the justifying work of Christ, I am kept from falling. That's the last verse, two verses of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. I will never be forsaken utterly. I will never fall. I am kept, I am held in God with Christ. And no one can pluck me out of his hands. So I await being presented faultless before God's presence in fullness of joy because of the simple saving faith in the justifying death of Christ. That's what I have. So seeing God's plan for his word in our new lives in Christ. This is what God wants us to see. God wants us to know. God wants us to live. And this morning, the sanctifying life of Christ is unleashed by his word. See, that's what the scriptures tell us. It says that blessed are the undefiled in the way. The way is the sanctifying path God wants us to walk. Every time I read the word, I see his way, and that's how I want to walk. Because I'm justified, when I read his word, I want to go that way. Who walk in the law of the Lord, that's the sanctifying teachings. God, his law, is teaching me. He's my teacher. And if I want to learn how to drive, I listen to that, you know, easy way driver's instructor. If I want to be a chef and I'm watching some cooking show, I try and learn how they do it. This is a divine teacher. And he shows me how I'm supposed to live and walk. And I mean, you know these. His testimonies are God's sanctifying uh, explanations of what real truth is. His sanctifying, get rid of that, his sanctifying truth. His testimonies are the truth that sanctifies me. His ways are the sanctifying path he wants me to walk. So I say, Lord, teach me your ways because you gave me a new heart. That's why the sword of the Spirit is so important. Another element of the sword of the Spirit is what God calls his precepts, and it's God's sanctifying directions. Uh, If you want to do life right, he's given directions. His statutes are his plans. He has plans for everything, like I shared with my um, uh, outdoor expert that had never focused his energies inside the house. God has plans for how you live inside your house, especially as a husband. And, And... They're sanctifying. I mean, he actually was excited to see the impact of being a servant leader in his home, following God's plans. Uh, God's commandments, his absolutes. See, we have these absolutes. Because we know the word of God, it's, it's, we have these, these absolutes in life that people can come to us and say, well, that's your opinion. You say, no, no, it's not my opinion. I wouldn't have even thought of that. That's God's word. 
And I ought to obey God rather than public opinion or culture or the way the wind is blowing. And God's judgments, another synonym for the Bible, is unchanging decisions. God has already determined what is right, what is wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. And it's all in his word. So this morning, God's statutes, his plans for our life, his word, his voice, he wants us to hear. I always talk about that, that when you read the Bible, you hear his voice. But this morning, God begins a new life in me that he keeps working on. Remember Philippians 1, 6? He that began a good work in you will perfect it. And the sword of the Spirit is what's explained in Psalm 119. So, this morning, and here, let me get to the last slide because it's time for communion. Um, Oh, let me just do these, okay? Oh, we can't. Uh, The new heart that God gave Ezra made him want the Lord. He wanted the word of God. Sanctification means I want the word of God. He loved God's ways. I rejoice in your way. He obeyed the word. And you can read that yourself. But the justifying death of Christ, which we're celebrating at communion, opens for me the sanctifying life of Christ which means this, God wants to unleash a new life so that when we take a little invitation and say, I'd like you to come to hear about the season of hope, those people are sensing we have a a different quality of life than they do because we are being sanctified because God has already justified us through the sacrifice of Christ. Let's bow for a a word of prayer to prepare for communion. And as we bow, I invite the elders and deacons to go and prepare to serve us. But Father, we bow our hearts before you. And this is a communion where I pray that we would meditate on the justifying once for all work you did for us, O Christ, on the cross. And that because we know that we're forgiven and that we have a new heart, that we would ask, because we love you, that you would help us to let the new life that you have called and given to us in Christ be more and more dominant in us, that you would sanctify us completely, that our whole spirit and soul and body would be under your sway, not because we have to do it, not because we're supposed to do it, but because we love you. And communion is when we declare how much we love you because we realize how much you've forgiven. And when we renew our desire to let you sanctify us by your word, I pray, O Lord, that this morning would be a moment in every one of our lives where we connect the justifying death of Christ and the cross that we celebrate in this communion with the sanctifying life you want to live out through us and that there would be a true reflection of the new me in Christ growing each day. Thank you for this bread, our entrance into your endless life through your body becoming sin for us. Thank you that we can worship you now. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.